Today, in the entire world, there are only three existing species of these archaic mammals that lay eggs. Two of them are echidnas, the long-snouted variety in New Guinea, and this one, the short-snouted variety, which can be found throughout Australia. The third member of the family is the strangest mammal known to man, the duck-billed platypus, a shy animal which lives in some rivers in the east of Australia. The rivers of Australia were no exception in the parallel evolution which has taken place over the 50 million years that Australia has been travelling alone across the Indian Ocean. Fish and invertebrates acquired new forms, some of them as strange as the Neoceratodus, the Australian lunged fish whose origins go back to the Devonian era, approximately 350 million years ago. But the most extraordinary creature now living in the rivers of Australia originally developed on land. The duck-billed platypus looks like an impossible compendium of different zoological types. From the time Dawson sent his controversial sample to the British Natural History Museum, there were constant scientific discussions, lasting for over a hundred years, until finally two zoologists demonstrated irrefutably that they were indeed mammals and reproduced by laying eggs. Although they are small in size, the duck-billed platypuses would seem to have an insatiable appetite. This one has found a river crab. Crustaceans, mollusks, annelids, and even amphibians form part of their extremely varied diet, and their peculiar morphology means they are able to hunt their prey even in muddy waters. Using its webbed feet and broad muscular tail to propel itself along, the archaic platypus searches the river bottom. The sensors on its beak detect the slightest movement or change in temperature. Any animal crawling or swimming along the riverbed is rapidly located and, if it is of any interest, devoured. In the rivers of Australia, the platypus is so well adapted it has no competitors, or rather, almost none. As in so many other environmental niches, the placentary mammals have also come up with a prototype. On this occasion, the result of the evolutionary process was the water rat or beaver rat, which was able to thrive in the aquatic world thanks to its waterproof fur and partially webbed feet. Strangely, no marsupial tried to colonize the rivers of Australia, and so the freshwater resources of this continent are shared between the modern water rat and the archaic duck-billed platypus. The Aborigines who arrived in Australia 50,000 years ago already knew the duck-billed platypus, which they named the water mole. A very appropriate name, given that the platypus lives out its amphibious life between the water, where it finds food, and the riverbanks, where it digs its tunnels. Their dependence on the rivers, however, limited the spread of the survivor from Gondwana. Because as Australia became increasingly dry, as the rivers of the interior slowly disappeared with the rise in temperatures, deserts were formed.
In the vast interior of Australia, water is the scarcest of all resources. Among these ancient mountains and valleys worn away by millions of years of erosion lie the last remaining watercourses of bone-dry Australia. The wallabies of Rothschild Rock seek out the shade of the enormous scars which the weather has gradually opened in the granite masses. Here in the irregular passageways of the rocky maze, there is a difference of at least 15 degrees centigrade compared to the surface scorched by the sun, while in the freezing cold nights, the rocks radiate back part of the heat absorbed during the day, and so they are also the wallabies' heating system. The valleys of the interior, protected by the oldest mountains on Earth, are the final concession of the climate of this new Australia, a continent inhabited by animals increasingly well equipped to cope with heat and drought. Because beyond these valleys, stretching across to an apparently infinite horizon, lies the unforgiving desert. Heat, wind and sand. Around three quarters of Australia is now arid desert terrain. Where in the past the prehistoric jungles grew, today the landscape is composed of dunes and rocks scorched and eroded. And nonetheless, the slow process which created the deserts turned mountains into sand also gave the marsupials time to get ready to conquer them. And once more, they managed to find a way. Sunset, when the scorching, merciless heat finally abates, marks the beginning of activity in the desert. The western barred bandicoots emerge from their lairs in search of small animals. Like them, the insect spiders and other invertebrates once more become active as twilight falls, and the bandicoots take advantage of this. Almost all the small marsupials which live in or around the desert take advantage of the shade and protection of the scarce, sparse bushes, digging their lairs beneath them, so that the entrance to their shelters is as protected and as cool as possible. For this reason, they rarely move far from them, and when they feel threatened, they run into the thicket where, hidden among the branches, they are able to reach the entrances to their lairs. The bilbies have also come out with the fall of night. Few animals are as strange looking as these inhabitants of the Australian desert. Their large ears and long snouts are what give them their extremely developed sense of hearing and smell. In the dark of the night and inside the large galleries which the bilbies dig, seeing is not important and so they are relatively short-sighted animals. It is their sense of smell which enables them to find the larvae, insects, seeds and fungi on which they feed, and their ears are able to detect the arrival of possible enemies, 
because the inhospitable desert is also home to a number of hunters. A monitor lizard is out hunting. This powerful lizard well knows the habits of the small marsupials and rodents of the desert regions and is sniffing around a clump of bushes looking for the entrance to the galleries in which the mammals take shelter during the daylight hours. In Australia, there are 20 species of monitor lizards or guanas as they are known here. They live in almost all the ecosystems of the continent, demonstrating their ability to adapt to all types of the environment. They are, in a way, the final revenge of those enormous dinosaurs which, in remote times, over 100 million years ago, ruled over these lands, now changed beyond all recognition. The blue-tongued lizard is much less powerful than its relatives, the monitor lizards, but evolution has ensured it is equipped to defend itself in this world of hunters and prey. A curious black-shouldered kite approaches and the lizard brings out one of its weapons. A large blue tongue, extremely threatening in appearance and moreover poisonous, serves to frighten off possible predators. This is not, however, the case of the black-shouldered kite, which after a brief inspection flies off. The Australian reptiles, like all the other classes of land animals, found their space within the generous and changing island in the southern hemisphere. But 50,000 years ago, a new creature arrived from the north. It was different from any of those already living here and had one devastating peculiarity. Instead of adapting to the environment, it forced the surroundings to change and to adapt to it. The arrival of man brought violent changes. Never before had Australia changed so rapidly and at such a speed that it did not give time for species to adapt. Along with man, other invaders also arrived. At first, with the Aborigines, they came slowly and in small numbers, giving rise to new species which displaced the native ones. This is the case of the dingo and the marsupial wolf. But with the arrival of the white colonists, the influx of aggressive invaders posed a serious threat to the wildlife of Australia. Rats, rabbits, cats and foxes, asses and dromedaries, buffaloes and wild pigs laid bare entire regions. These new invasions have demonstrated the fragility of an ecosystem which for so long remained isolated, and the not too distant future may well bring yet another threat. Australia continues on its slow drift northwards at a speed of six centimeters a year. At present, a narrow strait is all that separates the fauna of the two continents. But what will happen when the animals of Asia and Oceania come into direct contact? There may well be enormous upheavals in the uncertain future of this continent. It is easy to imagine that the evolution of its landscapes and animals will undergo far-reaching changes. But probably when new specialized creatures adapt to the unique conditions of these forests or deserts, causing many of the evolutionary prototypes that now dominate Australia to die out in the farthest depths of the jungle with their Pacific and archaic way of life, there will continue to be echidnas and duckbill platypuses. And, as in Gondwana and the distant past, there will continue to be mammals who lay eggs.